Hi, everyone. Welcome back. I'm Gabriel Allen Cummings. And I'm Brad Davidson, and this is Breaking the Code. A podcast series by the Havas Medical Anthropology Team. We're here to take the BS out of behavioral science by illuminating the why behind the what of behaviors, rituals, and symbols that people take for granted. We hope to arm you, our listeners, with the tools you need to make sense of behavioral science and help you apply it to your work as communication extraordinaires. So today we are utterly thrilled to have two of my favorite people in the Havas Network on the podcast. We are joined by Claire Knapp and Denise Malone, and we will be talking about women's sports. They are both very accomplished sportswomen, and they are also very senior in the company. So I will read their bios very quickly, and then we're going to just jump right in on the importance of sports for women, women's health, just society in general, all topics. So Claire is a the CEO of Havas Links. Having gra- started as a graduate fresh out of university, Claire Knapp is now the CEO of Havas Links, one of the most awarded healthcare communications agencies in the world, celebrated for its integration of creativity and science to deliver impact that matters. Claire is an internationally recognized keynote speaker on the mental health of healthcare professionals, ED&I within healthcare, and the importance of patient centricity in clinical trial design. Claire is also a very accomplished judo player and rugby player and played for one of the top teams in the UK. So that is where the sport comes in. And then so Denise is currently the managing director at Havas Life San Francisco and is the youngest woman to hold that role in the network. Havas Life San Francisco specializes in bringing creative and inspirational experiences that move people forward and help them thrive. Denise specializes in helping biotech in preclinical stages to prepare for commercialization and has helped to lead to over 20 launches, both globally and in the U.S. in her career so far. I have known both Denise and Claire for a long time. Denise is a horsewoman. She is a rider. She can talk more about that. I don't know much about horse riding. She's also a tennis player. She was a a very, very accomplished tennis player at the collegiate level, and I believe beyond, and still is involved with the ATP. And so these are two women who are both professionally very accomplished and very, very accomplished in the sporting world. And I'll just start out by saying, I don't think those two things are unrelated. So uh, why don't we start with Claire? How did sports help you in your journey towards CEO? Yeah, I mean, I think sports from my side has been fundamental to my life the entire way through. I started doing judo at the age of four and a half. So I I don't remember a life before sports. Um, And I think it's fair to say that it's crafted every element of my personality, my mindset, my approach to things, and and ultimately now my leadership style as well. I think a lot of that I can hone back to my my sporting days and growing up with winnings and winning, and also growing up with losing as well. Right, there's a lot that comes out of that. So, yeah, a huge amount of that comes through as well as being able to work in teams, hone yourself, do all the hard work behind the scenes so that you can show up correctly at the right moment. All of that comes comes from sport from my side of things. We'll get into everything that you just said, including like things like teamwork and leadership and the lessons of like training and working through pain and all that sort of stuff. But uh, Denise, how, let's just start the same one with you. How did, how did sports relate or how did sports help you get to where you are today? Yeah, very similar to Claire. I started both tennis and equestrian at the age of three. So I don't really have a memory without sports. And I think For me in particular, on the tennis side, it was all about the teamwork, figuring out how to work well with others while also pursuing my own goals. And then on the equestrian side, that's less of a team sport. That's a very much kind of an individual achievement. However, you're also partnering with a 1500 pound animal who doesn't speak your language. So understanding what kind of soft signals are, how to use kind of emotions, feelings, and figuring out how to read other people is something that I think Equestrian was really unique with. So there were so many skills that sports were able to really kind of inspire me and bring me forward from kind of a leadership and team building perspective. I think there's three ways people talk about sports. One is that it's good for the individual, like healthy body, healthy mind kind of idea. The other is the lessons of sport. So leadership, teamwork, hard work pays, right? The harder I work, the luckier I get kind of thing. And then the last one is just preparation for life for, you know, all of those sorts of, so sports for sports sake, but then also sports for life's sake. And 
it's interesting. We have been talking about this for ages. It's why we had you on the podcast for this. And it's it's a fascinating area right now. When you talk about gender in sport, there's so much movement. There's commercial movement. The money is going up. It's still way behind the men, but the money is going way up. Viewership is going way up. Professional sports leagues are being created everywhere. And it's a real pivot from when my mom was not allowed to play full court basketball because women were seen as not having bodies that could put up with that sort of couldn't even run the whole court right and the first time a woman was going to run a marathon there was literally doctors saying it's impossible she'll die right which obviously is not the case and this was a case of again medicine maybe getting it a little bit wrong maybe a lot of it wrong but where does sport fit in for you guys to the sort of evolving role of women in society and the perception of their capabilities? Yeah, I think it's hand in hand, isn't it? I mean, it's no um, surprise that as women have become more represented and more shown on the sporting side, it's also hand in hand with more women coming into business, leadership positions, government positions, etc. But equally, I think as a result of that, you're also seeing a very similar set of limitations and still a discrimination and inequalities across sport as you do see in other industries still so yeah great great to see the movement and i think still a huge amount left to go yeah the movement to me it's very parallel um i think when you think about the other day i watched nine to five right and it was one of those really fun moments of going back and watching that movie time and time again and while there's so much that's changed in the corporate world, there's still a lot to go. I think we've made a lot of great advancements. And obviously, you know, Claire, for me, is a huge example of that. But at the same time, <laughs> sports is in parallel. Because to your point, Brad, there was a point where women couldn't do sports to where they couldn't wear skirts to where they couldn't wear pants because it wasn't feminine to then, you know, now being able to have an amazing Olympic athlete as a woman who does rugby in the olympics become a star and now she's doing dancing with the stars right it's one of those things that i see them happening in parallel and are very closely connected and i think that speaks to the fact that leadership and women in the workplace is tied to women's sports at kind of every facet in my opinion so it's funny you bring up Alona Moore because Claire and I basically bond over rugby. And if there's time left over, we talk about work, but we talk rugby a lot. And Alona Moore has been on the, the sort of radar for a while in the rugby community as somebody who's been a very adept master of social media. She's also, if you don't know her, five foot 10 and 200 pounds. She is not dainty. She has huge muscles, very big shoulders. And gets a lot of flack. A lot of the stuff that people aren't showing right now is the TikTok she does of her crying because someone or many someones have said, like, aren't you a man or how could you possibly, right? Like, there's this idea that if you're going to be big and strong as a girl, you got to be small and you got to be quiet. You got to apologize for your size and and. It's been yep. wonderful for me to watch her like showing off her lats, man. She's got a huge back and and she's really into it. I mean, Claire and I have talked about her skill level, but there's no denying that she is a phenomenal athlete and is unapologetic about it, but still is wounded when people, you know, will be utterly cruel to her in ways that they aren't to men. Yeah. Yeah. There's no question. And I think I can equate it to tennis because the same thing happened to Serena Williams. Right. I remember yeah. Yeah. when Serena came onto the scene, everyone noticed and compared her to her sister. And it started to become, as she became more competitive, she knew that she had to change her style of play, which needed to be stronger and faster. And to mm -hmm. do that, she had to build muscle. But at the same time, she got so much flack and kind of bad media saying she was taking steroids and she looked like a man. And, you know, ultimately, she Which, was able... by the way, she looks nothing like a man. I, like... I agree. And it was something that, you know, in particular, as women's tennis players, we circled around her because to us and many now is, I mean, she is the goat when it comes to tennis, especially women's tennis. And it's because of her strength, in addition to the person she was on and off the court. But that level of muscle, whether it's tennis or rugby, there are places in sports where that is needed and it is set, should be celebrated. Yeah. 
And I think I think that's a broadest um, reality for all women sports players that regardless of whatever sport they're doing, when they get online, they will be attacked for their uh, physical appearance. Simone Biles obviously went through all of that with the hair commentary right. during the Olympics and beyond. It's it's a sad reality, but it's a reflection of the larger society and the misogyny that we still see. It's just being pinpointed at these women athletes, which is yeah, sad re- sad reality of today's sporting. There's reality. definitely some intersectionality of race there too. Brittany Griner's and another person who gets it for both being too big, too masculine, and frankly, too of color. You know, a lot of it sort of mixes up and it's, I can't put a finger on why people are so compelled to say terrible things to women online, but I I really find it strange, but also upsetting that it seems to be sort of almost a counter revolution, right? When you when you see women stepping out into the spotlight and going, here's my shoulders, I'm big. And like uh, Alona Moore was just on Dancing with the Stars and they recreated that very famous scene in Dirty Dancing where yeah. he lifts her, but then she lifts him, which I just mm-hmm. thought was the greatest inversion, right? Like, hey, I can do my own lifting. And in rugby, you actually lift people sometimes and she does. So yeah. she knows how to do it, but she lifted him pretty much better than he lifted her. It, you know, a lot of people were upset by that. I still don't really understand why. It just, it feels like the natural order is being upset. And there's nothing natural about telling women they can't use their bodies. I mean, uh, just to jump in there, there, you said, mentioned the intersectionality point between race. And I think about WNBA and how much they're growing because of Caitlin Clark. But I, I, I think about fans of Caitlin Clark. Some of them are like being racist in disguise and attacking the black women up that are a part of the WNBA and attacking black culture just under the guise of I'm a Caitlin Clark fan. And it's not to say that these reflect the views of the player th- themselves, but it's more just like weaponizing women's sports and Caitlin Clark herself, the growth of the WNBA in this nasty way to attack specific groups of women for how they look. I think I think the other thing, you know, equestrianism and tennis are wonderful sports, but they don't involve smashing people. And I like watching sports where people smash each other. So I watch a lot more rugby than tennis these days. But I, it is interesting. I coach youth rugby. In America, we're not great at rugby, right? So people are always sort of starting from a baseline. But what's fascinating to me is when I coach the girls, how often... I see this incredible reaction when they get to tackle somebody for the first time and they get to be like muddy and tough and, you know, and they get into their first game and they, it's, it's transformational to, to tell women that you can be rough and dirty and curse and spit and smack each other and bleed and get back out there. And it seems like a lot of the I don't know if they're girls or women, they're like 15 to 17, whatever. The 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 young female athletes who show up have never been given that opportunity ever. The guys I get, they roughhouse all the time. They're just like, oh good, throw a ball in and we'll figure it out. But for the for the women, I really have to teach them to be violent in some ways. I don't I don't maybe violence the wrong word, but but there's a certain amount of violence in rugby, you know. And I think I I feel like I'm doing a service by teaching them that it's okay in spaces to be big to be loud to to be dirty to take up space and they really take to it i mean did you have that experience at all claire you were a combat yeah. sportswoman for a long time Definitely. i mean also your women's seven teams are, are pretty good so you don't don't put down the whole of oh that's fair team. um but yeah no 100 i mean i i adored rugby for a few different reasons including the fact that you were allowed and you were encouraged to be aggressive and, and physical on the pitch you also you know you you're doing a disservice to your team if you're not shouting at each other now i played scrum half which is known as the gobby little position so i was constantly shouting at the people around me going get in that rock get in the more put the ball out get out tackle legs da, da, da. so you're you're encouraged to be as vocal as you possibly can be which when you're a little girl you know you're not necessarily encouraged to be aggressive you're not encouraged to be vocal um and the other reason that i always love rugby is that we always talk about it as the fact that there is there is a position for everybody if you're big and you're strong, fantastic. Let's get you on the second row or in the forwards. If you're light and you're quick and you're agile, let's get you on the wing. So whatever kind of style and personality you have and whatever physical build you have, there is a position for you in the rugby in the rugby club. So I've always loved the inclusivity of it as well as the fact that you're encouraging all those attributes that naturally society seems to try and trim down on, on women and particularly young girls. I think I think the other thing that we've talked about is the uniforms that we're now at a 
phase where women are finally, I mean, literally finally, like this Olympics was the first time that uh, women were allowed to choose their own uniforms in certain sports, right? That uh, beach volleyball, you're basically in a bikini, not basically you're in a bikini and you were mandated to be in that bikini. And then this year you saw women playing beach volleyball in Paris and leggings. And some women chose to still wear the, you know, the, the bikinis, but a lot of women didn't. And it was, it was really interesting. And there was a lot of analyses around women's uniforms as a, a pander to men, right? Claire and I talked about this a lot, that the, the, I think it was the Scottish women's team. And I think it was the Scottish women's soccer slash football team who petitioned to get rid of white shorts from their away kit because they didn't want to be worried about, you know, period stains, frankly. Mm -hmm. And it sort of opened up a discussion between me and Sanika and me and Claire about like, is this a good thing? Is this a bad thing? Should we be ashamed of periods? And Sanika came out and said, like, the fact that we're talking about it, we're giving women choices is unequivocally a good thing. So I'm just curious, like, where do, where do you guys fit on that? You know, like the, the whole evolution of it, it all seems to be trending in a good direction. Is this another... Of course, it's a positive step, but I mean, what, what does it represent? I think it's a positive. I think any time that you're able to give an athlete the choice is going to be a good one. And I think that's for men or women. I mean, when I think about it, tennis versus equestrian, I mean, equestrian, we have to wear pants. There's no choice. And equestrian, in a lot of ways, had a lot of equality from the get-go. So I don't think that, you know, that sport in particular was of issue I think in tennis, though, it was a huge issue, whether it was the color of the clothes, as we all know, with Wimbledon, the requirement to wear white, and that will not be going away anytime soon, to the fact that women in 98% of the professional matches are required to wear skirts. It's something that is asked for skirts or dresses, and only that 2% has opened it up. And I think while that can, and I can say as a player, a skirt in tennis does allow a great deal of freedom for running. But similar to kind of what athletes went through with swimming, as an example, in terms of the body suits, if there happens to be advancements in different uniforms that would be better for me to get around the court, for to have copper technology to help my legs not get as fatigued as I'm out on the court for three and a half hours then you can bet that I'm going to choose to wear that if I have a choice. So I think the biggest piece for me is about having the choice of what I can wear and utilize that's best for my sport and the outcome. And I think we're getting there, but I think that certain established sports that have been around for a long time with that feminist desire of seeing the female body, I think it's going to take longer. Yeah, I'd probably build on as well around inclusivity and intersectionality that, that Gabe mentioned earlier. You know, a lot of uniform still and sporting attire isn't very inclusive for female Muslim athletes. No. And I know, you know I've seen uh, Nike have started to produce a couple of items, but that in itself is a massive challenge that we still need to face if we are truly going to encourage all women to be able to partake in sport. I think I just saw that over the weekend, the first fully hijab a uh, woman wearing a full hijab scored the first try in professional women's rugby in the league this year, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, I think we had tries, there's football, there's swimming. I, I would struggle to count more than a handful of sports, though, that have actually yeah. taken those steps. Yeah, I would agree. I would agree. What does this all mean, you know, like for society? Uh, we're, you know, we're sort of coming... We've talked a lot about the facts, you know, the, the viewership in the WNBA is up, money is up, everything is up, everything is trending up. What does this all mean? It probably means that women are beginning to get a little bit more exposure and equality, but I think I think it's important that we don't jump the gun, though. That, I mean, there's still a huge, huge right. marathon ahead of us. I think the quality of women's sport right now compared to the investment is staggering, and I truly and genuinely prefer watching women's soccer to men's soccer because I find it a lot more entertaining, and the same in a lot of different kind of sports. So I think it's great that we're getting that exposure. I think it's great that we're getting those advancements, and I I hope that the next step as well is that we start really looking at how future investments in women's sports can propel the the quality, the skill set and, and reduce injuries more in the future. I mean, say going back to soccer again, women's soccer athletes have got significantly higher levels of ACL injuries compared to, compared to men. Yes. 
And that, that for me, I think there's a huge amount of research and development that needs to be done in that space so that we can find and unlock the next level uh, of women's sport. I think a lot of this stuff was taboo, and I think it's become taboo again. And I mean taboo very specifically in the we're not allowed to talk about it. It's sort of seen as like uncouth to talk about it. But uh, you and I have talked about like women's uh, menstrual cycles affect their performance. We know that. We know your O2 max is different. We know one of the things we're starting to look into, or maybe we're well down the road. If anybody knows, please email us, right? But uh, you mentioned ACLs. One of the things we know is that certain hormones are present during menstruation that loosen the ligaments. It's the same hormones that are present during labor and delivery. And they're starting to, they're starting to track, is it a menstrual cycle that makes you at least a little more vulnerable to a catastrophic knee injury. There's also architecture, right? Wider hips lead to more acute angles when the long bones meet and stuff like that. But in general, we haven't studied any of it. You know, we're just starting to yeah. now. And that's, that's, I think, one of the biggest gaps is women are not smaller men. Well, first of all, Alona Moss yeah. not smaller than me, but I'm just saying in general, women are, no bodies tend to be smaller, but that doesn't make them identical. Yeah, and the same on equipment, football boots, sorry, yeah. soccer boots, I should say. You know, all of the equipment has been grounded in centuries of research and development yeah. around how to make a male athlete perform better. That doesn't naturally tran or necessarily translate through to, is it going to make a, a female athlete perform better? Yeah. How has it influenced your leadership style, Denise? Claire, maybe that's a good one to, to loop it back to business. Now, I know you've both said you can't imagine being you without having sports because you were both put on a horse or put in a judo uniform before you were old enough to open the front door, basically. So like, but how has sporting either, either overtly or even tacitly maybe or unconsciously sort of influenced your leadership and and you know here's where you could give a shameless plug for the importance of sports to women in evolving society always give a shameless plug for that um you know i think for me there's something about sports that leads to a sense of confidence and i think that confidence that i gained at such a young age was I felt very sure of myself because of some of the decisions that I had to make as an athlete. I think a lot of times people underestimate in sports the, the mental game that goes into it. They think about it during your matches, but what they don't realize is that the matches are only about 10% of the time. 90% of the time is preparing, learning, taking care of your body, the discipline that you have to have to do that. And for equestrian, it's also taking care of another live being as well. So I think that you gain, and I think this is true for men and women. I don't necessarily think it's just women, but I think you gain a level of confidence and discipline that I know I've brought to my business career, but it's in particular for women. And I would say young women. And one of the reasons why I love working with youth in my sports that I play is because to see them be unsure on day one and then work with them for a year or two and see the difference in terms of kind of how they come into themselves and they know themselves, they know their bodies better, they know how to make decisions. To me, that's something that I can't look at anything else personally that I think does as good of a job that sports does. I just yeah. don't. Yeah, no, I, I actually agree with that 100%. Claire, what do you, what do you think? Yeah, I'd, I'd completely agree as well. And I think, you know, the confidence point is on the nose because women in, in business often struggle with confidence, particularly coming back from things like maternity leave. I see confidence levels plummet. So being able to apply that ability to drag up your confidence and use sport as a mechanism to do that is credible. I think on my side, I would say, particularly around leadership, it is easy, or at least it's a lot, lot easier to lead when you're winning. You know, and that's true on the field and it's true in business. If you're playing a rugby match and you're 40 nil up, but you drop a ball, you make a mistake, someone misses a tackle, no one cares because you've still got the scoreline and everyone's celebrating. It is so much harder to lead when you are losing. And I think that in particular is one of the biggest lessons to take from sport into business because learning to grow out of loss 
is one of the hardest things you can do as a human. Like it, it means being vulnerable. It means putting down barriers, looking at where you could be better, looking at where you weren't good enough, but still maintaining the confidence and belief that you can be better and you will do better. So I think losing actually in sport has probably been one of the best mechanisms of helping me then be able to manage the ups and downs of being a leader and being in business. And in particular, you know, we've all been in that game and we've certainly all been in that business where you have tried your absolute best. Your team has done flawlessly throughout. Everyone has chucked themselves into it. The level of quality was phenomenal and you still lose. That is the hardest thing to bounce back from and, you know, manage the balance between keeping confidence and morale up, but acknowledging that every dog has their day and every dog doesn't have their day. So yeah. that, for, that for me has probably been the biggest parallel. Yeah. I, I just have to say that's one of my favorite things about watching athletes in general, seeing them try as hard as they possibly can. And then even in defeat, they're like, you can see the pain and the anguish, the the anger, but then they're also in the same breath saying like, it was just one day. We have to move on to the next one. We have to move on. One thing that really stuck out to me as far as like leadership and coaching, uh, both of you are in leadership positions. So as far as like helping the people who are on your team, the people who are you, you are raising up to work with you, how has sports influenced that as from like a leadership, maybe more of a coaching perspective? Yeah. I mean, mentorship is part of the game, right? In business. And I have valued so much the mentors that I've had already in my career. And I think a lot of that comes from the fact that I'm used to having a coach. What's interesting is when I mentor other people, sometimes, and this is just an observation that I've had, if they haven't played sports, it's very interesting to see the difference in the interaction and the kind of acceptability of the feedback and the desire to take it, learn and apply it. There's a little more resistance up front because they've never had that relationship of a coach who's there to help them along the way, even if sometimes it's a tough discussion or tough to hear. And so again, another applicability, I think in sports, we learn how to take feedback. We know how to take it and apply it. And I find that sometimes I have to change my leadership style a little bit to help those who haven't played sports and don't know what that means. And that's kind of been a really fascinating finding for me personally. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Like, I, I think when you're talking to an individual that hasn't played sport, and it's not all of them, of course, but yeah, yeah I mean, it's very normal in sports, even if you've won to go, here's five things we could have done better. And that, that doesn't yeah, always resonate, always. And particularly my personal style as well is going, well, that was great, but let's focus where we could have got better. And yeah. I do definitely have to be really deliberate about flexing my style. I probably don't do it well enough. If anyone who works with me is listening to this, they're probably going, you still need to work on that. But there is definitely an element of trying to be a bit more cognizant of it. I think as well on the mentorship side and particularly nurturing our talent, one of the things I'm grateful for sport for and particularly the team sports, you know, judo is a very individualistic sport, but rugby very much is a team sport, is that the thing I learned with rugby is that you need people to have different talents. So if you've got 15 people that can run quick, you're not going to win the game. And I think bringing that through into my business world and the people that I mentor and the people that I uh, manage has been really helpful because I'm not trying to create mini me's. I just want them to be the best version of themselves and that bring that diversity of skill set so that we as a team can flourish because you do need the, all of those different uh, skill sets, capabilities, personalities uh, to be able to be a really kind of strong business. So that's another thing that I've probably brought through from the sporting world. Yeah, I think that's something that um, we talk a lot about coaching high school students and and also other youth organizations I've been in, which is, you know, somebody misses a tackle that leads to a score. They know they missed a tackle. Like, it's not helpful to go like, miss the tackle. Like, that, that's just piling it on, right? Your job is to help them be better because otherwise you're going to lose. And that's something that we tell the guys on the field all the time. We don't have to say it too much to the girls as much. It's interesting. The guys jump on each other sometimes. They're, they're, it's sort of a competitive, we'll build you up by breaking you down sort of mentality. And we have to break them of that and go like, this guy knows he messed up. Like what your job is to tell him it's fine, he'll make the next one because otherwise you're going to lose by 100 points, not seven. And it's not something that we do a good job of teaching the men. And you know, maybe this is a different sort of discussion, but... One of the things I like about women's sports from a man's perspective is because they're being built as we're going, 
some of the sort of more dysfunctional cultural aspects of things like men's football teams, American football, right? Where there's really not a lot of lessons taught sometimes with the, the main lesson is if you're really big and really strong and really good at football, you can do whatever you want and we'll cover for you. And that's not something I see so much with women's sports because again, they don't, they don't end up making $50 million. So they don't have a posse of people sort of feeding off of them. But it's interesting how many of the athletes I get who have been good athletes all throughout their young lives on the male side I really need to tone them down and go like, we're not going to win if you keep doing that, right? You're Everybody's just going to stop playing with you. Whereas with the women there, they seem, I don't want to say inherently collaborative because that's sort of like a gendered thing, but they, they seem not to have learned the toxic lesson of like beat them up to bring them up, um, which I would love to keep. But as the money gets bigger and bigger and bigger, that's one of the dangers I worry about. But that's just sort of like amateurism versus professionalism. And I'm certainly not trying to deny women money or you'd ask to stay pure or something. But like, what is the, the role men can play? Because I, I do have insight into some of the really toxic stuff that goes on in, in men's sports where we we apply two sets of rules to the really good athletes in baseball and in football. And you'll say you have to football, especially you have to take all of August off in high school football because you've got to be there. You I don't care if your family's going on vacation, but then you never see the field. And the guy who did go on vacation, but is six foot two and can run a really fast 40, he's on the field anyway. Right. And so the thing people learn is if you're good, you can break the rules. And that is a universal across most football teams that I'm aware of. Um, again, I've only sampled a couple, but I would love to get rid of that. And I don't know how. And I'm wondering if there's an opportunity in women's sports. And then just the final question for you guys is like, what can Gabe and I do to help? Like, what's the right role? How can men help women build sports for women? It's a big question. I, look, I, I think I am a, I'm luckier than most because I think I focus on sports in particular where there is great support from men. And what I mean by that is that in the tennis world, um, they there is a very big camaraderie that exists because of not only the tours, the tours may be separate and they may not be able from the ATP to the WTA, they're not always in the same cities. But at the Grand Slams, one of the best things that you'll see is that whether it's men's or women's, if they can watch them, they will. And there is that team kind of camaraderie that exists. And in equestrian, which just to make the play on being the horsewoman, is the only sport in the world where men and women, they compete today and have always competed equally against each other. Hmm. That's the only sport in the world. There is no separation by gender with equestrian. And I think that for me... What that's allowed is that I have never felt any kind of negativity from men in the equestrian world because we compete against each other equally. Same amount of money, same amount of training, same amount of everything. And same horse. Yeah, I mean, well, not the same horse, hopefully, but it's still a 1,500 pound animal. And so there's a mutual respect that is has nothing to do with gender. So I think that if I think about men's roles, I think seeing the fight for equality, of course, is always going to be something that is a benefit. But more than that, for me, is the support of it. The fact that male professional athletes or amateur athletes or whoever it may be, dads, coaches, have equal support for the women's sports that they do for the men's. That, to me, would be a huge element if we started to see more of that crossover happening on a consistent basis because, and it goes for the women as well. That's not just saying the men have to come support the women. The women need to go support the men as well. And that creates a balance to me that I think can only benefit long term. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think I totally agree. And I think... Um participation and like attendance at women's sport. I go to a lot of women's sporting games. And one of the things that always strikes me is the difference in the crowd demographic compared to, yeah. compared to men's sport. In the most wonderful way, you know, you get families, you get generations coming together. And I think that is a huge thing that men can do is come to sport, bring their sons, bring their daughters and demonstrate 
in that moment that women's sport is valuable it's skillful it's worth paying for and all of those attributes that that allows us to kind of trickle this through into the next generation and genuinely I think it's a nicer environment as well I've been to men's soccer games in the UK and it's it's horrible you know they're swearing they're shouting it's a minimum security prison riot I don't like men's soccer in Europe I mean there's a reason There's a reason they don't let alcohol in the stadium, right? And versus if you go to women's sporting events and women's soccer games, it's it's beautiful. There's families there, there's dads with their kids, there's mums with their kids, everyone's together, they're having a lovely, enjoyable day. And I think that's that's a huge way of going towards making sure that that we bring up this next generation to see that quality and to see this as as something valuable and worth participating in. How is it for me as a as a girl dad? And I'll just give my two cents on this, like it has opened an opportunity for my daughter and I to share things together that we, you know, she doesn't want me to shop with her. She thinks I have no taste. She's probably right. You know, she, doesn't, she is right. She, she is a hundred percent right. Yeah. I, I look like I got dressed in the dark most days, but, but uh, you know, like I, I did a lot of camping with the boys. She doesn't like camping, but uh, I got an opportunity to take her to a professional women's rugby match out in England. And I took it and we went, kind of expensive, but we went for a weekend to Leicester to watch the Leicester women's rugby play. I can't remember who they played, but it was awesome. And I have been doing that with the boys at different sporting events for a long time. And there just wasn't the reason I jumped at the opportunity. I was like, I haven't been able to take it anything that you were dying to see. We go to like American football games sometimes, but we go as a family and that's, it's expensive. It's just a totally different pageant, right? Like this is like sports for the sake of sports. And it was Awesome. And I got to say, the women who found out that we had flown from America specifically to go see them, I have photos of her on the pitch. There's some girl like lifting her up. And it was like they were so enthusiastic. It's still in that nascent phase of they're just they're just so happy to know that there's actual fans who are willing to go out of their way and put down money and go see them play and cheer them on and you know tell them nice nice job even though you lost kind of thing and and it was it was amazing to me it was a real eye opener and I'm I kind of got to treasure that one because she got her jersey signed by everybody and stuff like that and it was it was a real eye opener but again it's it's still small you know the the stands were half empty you can't get a ticket to Leicester men's rugby like you just can't, it's hard to get. And so it's still in that sort of like growing yeah. phase. And my, my hope, my hope is that we learn some of the lessons from men's sports about from the bad old days, right? It's hard to get rid of them when they're already built in, but there's opportunities to just build a new sort of sporting model without it being in. It doesn't have to be toxic. It doesn't have to be ruthless and mean and dismissive and destructive to your body and all that sort of stuff. So I don't know. I'm I'm super excited by what it represents, both for itself. I love women's sports. I love watching athletes be athletic. And and just what it means for women in society in general. Again, I'll go back to my mom, who was a tremendous athlete and wasn't allowed to really participate fully because, quote, they needed to protect her, unquote, which was garbage, you know. When we moved to the, you know, when she moved to the suburbs of Connecticut, you'll like this story, Denise. She fired my dad from mixed doubles because he wasn't competitive enough. Yeah, she was like, I'm not having you as my partner anymore. You don't care. You don't lunge for the ball. You'll just watch it go by. So she fired him and she just had other partners. I mean, it's, I mean good for her, uh, yeah. you know, because, but that shows her competitive spirit. I think yeah. like that's something, it's funny when you were talking about taking your daughter. I had a very supportive father with all my sports, but even when he took me to college football games, which I still go to, by the way, he never limited me from cheering. He never limited me from screaming like a banshee, right. Right. which I still do today, 35 years later, after going to my first game, I paint my face. I know more about college football from attending those games with my dad than most of the men in the stands. And so I do think, and I will make a plug for girl dads out there everywhere and moms, like go take your kids to sporting events, even if they don't play sports and encourage them to get into it and learn it and have fun and scream and be, you know, at kind of not the norm, like we've been talking about, that people think 
women or girls should be, go be that 10 year old screaming in the stands, losing her mind at a ref call, because that alone can teach you a lot just from that experience too. I think we, we've got another common thread here. One of the reasons I'm so into sport is because my mom always took me to sport and is so competitive herself. She's famous actually locally for when I was, well, bear with, uh, when I was a kid, she did, uh, joined one of the local, if I say rounders as a sport, does that mean anything to you? You mean like early baseball? It's- it, it means something like, to me, but I lived in England. It's like it's a, kind of it's like softball. it's an English form of softball, yeah. I would say. Mm-hmm. Um, it's very, very passionate sport in Britain. And she did the local church rounders game. And she's famous for in that game, turning to first base and saying, catch the effing ball, you stupid. My <laughs> mom was famous for shouting, come on at every match and she would go to my son's rugby matches and he's like all i can hear is grandma yeah there's something about competitive parents huh there's something about competitive parents well it's funny you say that denise like i for years i would take my sons pretty far like we live about a four and a half hour drive from where the patriots play i am in giants territory new york football giants territory and it was an investment in not having giants fans for children to take them once a year to a patriots game hq as we call it right i'd always buy four tickets my daughter typically deferred and then one year i took her and i just remember where our seats are they're by the tunnel and they were playing fortuna the carmina barana thing boom (laughs) boom dun 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 and there's fireworks and there's people screaming and Tom Brady runs out of the tunnel and 73,000 people are just going berserk. And she, I swear to God, she looked at me and she goes, I get it. And I think that's what led her actually to being willing to take on rugby. I think you're right. I think exposing women to that, that sort of ability to just lose yourself in the crowd and scream and know what's going on and participate. It's so tribal, you know, when we denied it to yeah. women for so long, yeah. it's, it's really, that's, that to me, the, the sort of tribal nature of sports, being part of something is yeah. so, so, so important. We've not really talked about it, we probably don't have a time, but the other aspects of sport, of course, is the friendship groups. Yeah, the social mm. groups, the tribes mm. you create. My closest friends now are all sporting friends from playing rugby. There's something about covering each other's tackles and trying to make sure you don't get killed on the rugby pitch, which has bonded us for life. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean, I have my tennis group, which like we travel around the world to different tennis tournaments and we rely on support. And then my riding community, we call ourselves like the the crazy adult Amies. I mean, I go to them with everything and we sit around also on a Friday night after a lesson, you know, having a drink and talking about life. It's there is such a connection that you make. And I didn't know that as a kid that that was going to happen, but they are lifelong friends and people that you rely on on your daily because you have fun with them. Man, that's a good note to end on. So listen, we've been trying to get this together. As you can imagine, these are two of the busiest women in the organization. So getting them together for an hour has been virtually impossible, but we did it. And I'm so glad we did it. We've been dying to do this conversation. Maybe we'll do it again sometime. Maybe we'll, uh, we'll, we'll talk more about the importance of the bonds you make and stuff. But, but for now, I just think this was a wonderful conversation and I'm, I'm really appreciative of the time you guys took. I appreciate your friendship and I appreciate being able to talk sports to both of you. And, uh, yeah, I mean, any, any last thoughts before we cut the tape? Just to say thanks so much for having me. And Denise, it's been so lovely to actually get time to talk to you as well. I know, you <laughs> too. We have so much in common. We're going to have to connect on sports after this. But, uh, no, guys, thank you. I'll talk about sports anytime. This is yeah. great. All right. Well, for Breaking the Code, I'm Brad Davidson. On behalf of Claire, Denise, myself, and Gabe, thanks for listening. And, uh, yeah, see you next time. See you, everybody. Breaking the Code is a podcast created by the Havas Medical Anthropology Group, hosted by Brad Davidson and Sonika Garcia, content and post-production audio editing done by Gabriel Allen Cummings, and inspiration from all of you. Thank you for listening and for your continued support. If you enjoy these episodes, we'd love to hear from you. Please leave a rating, subscribe, and send us a message to our mailbox at medicalanthropology at Havas.com. Until next time.